This morning we have the privilege of the first lecture of Robert Moore for us in this conference. Robert Moore is a Jungian analyst. He is a training analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute in Chicago. He is also a professor of psychology and religion at Chicago Theological Seminary. He's the editor of Carl Jung and Christian Spirituality, which is a book that you will find over here on the table. There are six more volumes already under contract of this series. That book is a series. And there are six others under contract which will examine the relationship of Carl Jung to other uh, major religions of the world. He's the president of the Institute for World Spirituality as well and, and also is the co-editor of Jung's Challenge to Contemporary Religion. Robert was a lecturer for us uh, a few years ago and he spoke then on the masculine archetypes in a very powerful way. At that particular time, we were into a lot of the feminine archetypes and uh, the feminine involvement, and there were a lot of men that said, we need some masculine in input. And so we called upon Robert, and it was a powerful series. And I know what he has to offer for us now will also be a powerful time and experience. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure for me to be here with Journey into Wholeness again. It's an honor for me to be part of the advisory board. Uh, I really believe in the work that Jim and Annette and all of you are doing. I think it's one of the most important institutionalizations of the provision of a forum for, for the discussion of the important relationships between Jungian thought in general and uh, Christian spirituality uh, in, in particular, as well as the uh, widespread struggle to formulate a human spirituality which is equal to a uh, postmodern planetary culture. And this is an enormously important thing, and it's, it's a joy to be with all of you. Now, John Dowerly, uh, last evening, was emphasizing a lot of uh, the contribution, as he views it, of, uh, of Jung's uh, theological ideas. Uh, I'm going to emphasize uh, this morning, especially, and in my second lecture, uh, the psychology uh, itself, the, the uniqueness of Jung's psychology and why it is we turn to Jung's psychology particularly and not just others. Um, and so I want to say a little bit about uh, the uniqueness of Jung's psychology. Uh, for those of you who are not schooled in comparative psychology or comparative uh, psychoanalytic theory, uh, I'm privileged to have the responsibility of teaching comparative psychoanalytic theory at the doctoral level. <clears throat> As some of you know, uh, before I was a Jungian psychoanalyst, I was an Adlerian psychoanalyst. And before I wrote anything on Jung, I wrote my first book was a Freudian book. Uh, so I have sort of uh, recapitulated uh, the history of the psychoanalytic movement in my long journey. Uh, my niece once asked me why I went to school so long, and I said, honey, some of us just take longer than others to get around to the right things. But let me just say just a word. It seems to me that the genius of Jung's psychology, which we... Uh, who are, are theorists and practitioners of his psychology have to constantly keep in mind is his understanding that the unconscious is structured. Now, this, this is an in, incredibly important idea, and let me just say why, because it's the only school of psychoanalytic theory that views the unconscious as uh, a place that can actually be mapped. Uh, it is related to Chomsky's uh, model of linguistics, that there are in fact deep structures in the human psyche, in the unconscious, that the unconscious is not just like Freudians used to teach. Uh, 
a cauldron of energy that is basically chaotic. The unconscious is full of deep structures which influence and in too many ways determine the life of the ego. And so if you'll think a moment about that, if, if Jung is right, as I believe he is, it means that serious, careful study can help open up a geography of the inner world so that you will not be totally lost when you start exploring the psyche and psychic life. That is, there are predictable things that you can recognize in the inner world. And this is not uh, uh, something which is just somebody's conceptual idea. These are things which Jung viewed as being something we find empirically through research. This is a phenomenological investigation. These are not somebody's uh, strange mystical religious ideas. These are structures in the psyche which can be seen whether you're a Jungian or not, if you can look carefully enough. And so what I want to emphasize this morning is, is Jung's psychology as a scientific empirical psychology of the deep structures of the human unconscious. Uh, the way to talk about this is the archetypes are not Jungian. They are human. Jung simply was a pioneer in map, beginning to map them. And there have been others that have done this. Now, what I want, I'll get to end, now get into showing you why that is important in the context of our conference and our topic. The first thing, I'd like to do a number of things. I've got too much here <laughs> to do. And we'll see how far we get this morning, and I'll pick up, if I don't get as far as I want to get, I'll pick up in the second uh, presentation tomorrow. But, but here's the way I want to proceed. First, I want to give you a quick geography of the different spaces in the unconscious, in the objective psyche, particularly located in uh, what we call the, the archetypal self or the conjunctio. Then I want to show you where I, in terms of my research, locate the psychology of Satan. There is a particular location in the archetypal structures in the psyche where you can see the human preoccupation with evil. And then I will move into elaborating that in terms of what has been called the combat myth. Because the struggle between good and evil has always in human culture been, been talked about in terms of the combat myth. And I want to lay, show you the, the salient aspects of the combat myth. And uh, <clears throat> then I want to show you some different psychoanalytic perspectives on what may be going on in this combat myth. What is this that is being combated? In other words, we need this morning to reflect upon the psychological understanding of what we would call evil. And we throw around the word evil a lot. And we tend to get too much into these meta, 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 meta discussions about uh, the provatio boni and all these things. But I'm a clinician primarily, uh, and not a meta, meta, meta theoretician primarily. And so I want to show you uh, uh, in today and, and tomorrow the concrete clinical experiential uh, things in psychopathology that you can recognize as being manifestations of the psychology of evil. Now, during the course of our discussions, we will have an opportunity for you to think and do your spiritual theology, because you're all going to have to do your own theology of this stuff, because, because it admits of different interpretations. And so one of the last things I'll try to get to today is showing you what Paul Ricoeur, the great uh, philosopher, would call the, the conflict of interpretations on this. There are many ways to draw uh, conclusions about uh, the way in which evil is structured psychologically and the meaning of that theologically. So we'll see. I'm just going to present to you some of the options. I'll, I will tell you what seems to make more sense to me, but uh, I can't play uh, Vatican here for you. So you're, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to do your own theology and struggle with that this week. So if you're ready... Uh, uh, feel free to raise your hand during my presentation. I'm going to go awfully fast. The material this morning is about eight hours of material. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the ground running. <laughs> I've got to be able to see it too. The, uh, 
<clears throat> this first business is is a business. This is this is research in pro process now, and uh, <clears throat> it's going to take a long time to develop this adequately. But I I am known more uh, for my work on the psychoanalysis of space and, and ritual around the world. I I'm I'm known widely in terms of being a specialist in in the study of psychoanalysis and ritual, and particularly ritual spaces. Uh, I have continued that work, <clears throat> and uh, I have come to work on a kind of a structural analysis which, which uh, is grounded in Jung's thought but carries it forward empirically uh, in terms of the different spaces in the psyche, uh, in terms of the different ways in which the... Uh, you, you have studied some alchemy, and you know that Jung talked a lot about the, uh, uh, the Mysterium Conjunctionis, the, uh, the king and queen within, uh, and that many Jungians believe that is the most adequate representation of the archetypal self. That the archetypal self, uh, people talk about it being represented clearly with Christ, but actually the most adequate, in terms of Jungian psychoanalysis, the, the most adequate representation of the archetypal self is really, <clears throat> is really the Rex and Regina, the, the king and queen of the alchemical couple. And uh, this, you see this clearly in terms of the fact that we are all uh, containing, we all contain both sexes in the deep structures of our psyche. And, uh, <clears throat> but what I have found in my work is that this, this archetypal couple, uh, when you look empirically at individuals, you find them, you find that they manifest themselves in very discrete ways in different people. And, uh, and while you can say that the, that the center of the psyche is expressed and imaged best in terms of the king and queen, you also find a warrior couple within. You also find a priest and priestess within, or the magician couple. You also find a pair of lovers within. If I had time, I would go into a lot of the mythology which elaborates this. Now, in terms of world mythology, the king and queen take on these different personas at different times in their life. If they're making love, they're manifesting in this form, Aphrodite and Eros. Uh, if they are manifesting <clears throat> as the great uh, magician, you may have seen Morton Smith's book, Jesus the Magician. Well, then they are in this form. If they're the priest and priestess of magic, they're, they're represented here. If they are, if they are on the warpath, uh, we see this a lot in marriages here. Uh, I'm not kidding you. I won't, I, we'll get into that. Because, because if, you, if you are in the warrior space, and you're trying to deal with your spouse, and your spouse doesn't understand this deep structural psychological stuff, that spouse may get into the warrior space with you. And if you don't understand that your job together is to fight chaos and not each other, you're going to have problems. Uh, but anyway, so, so, so the king and queen manifest this way, and then they manifest uh, in terms of their role as the center of the world. And so you have four different manifestations in the conjunctio, and the only way to really get a sense for this is to study world mythology about the gods and goddesses. And you will see, when you study the gods and goddesses, you can start with Jean Bolin's work on this, uh, gods and every woman, goddesses and every woman, uh, gods and every man, and so forth. And you can see in the variety of the expressions of the gods in mythology, different ways in which, different times in which they manifest in these different ways. But it's all, the, uh, in, in terms of a psychoanalytic viewpoint, it's all various manifestations of the great man and the great woman within, which is the archetypal self. <clears throat> now, that's a whole thing in itself. Yes. Oh, yes, I'm going to do that right now. Uh, <clears throat> The four different spaces that are created, this is the interesting thing, that, and I'm teaching courses now on, on the relationship of this to couple therapy, because, because there, there are distinct psychosocial spaces, spaces that exist in each of these, with each of these couples as they manifest in, in the psyche. 
if a husband or a wife is in the king and queen uh, on the throne kind of space, they will be almost all parent. They will be invested in creating a cosmos or world. This is cosmos in the technical sense that Iliadi uses it. This is a ordered, justly ordered world. And there's no sexuality to speak of here. You wouldn't even know that the king and queen had genitals in this, in this modality. And when a husband and wife get into this, their sex life goes to hell. You see? If they're locked into this. Now, so the space that emerges in the king and queen is this, this world building, or we'd say family building, home building. Nest making, you know, business building, you know, so forth, so forth. church building. You know. uh, but anyway, it's a very special kind of space with very special kind of concerns, and it excludes the others. If you want to know why some clergy are not interested in spiritual direction, ask yourself, well, are they locked into the king stuff or the queen stuff? Because if they're into the king, being the king or queen, they're not they're probably not interested in the spiritual direction stuff which is here See. okay you follow that okay so the space the space of spiritual direction is here the spiritual direction and liturgical leadership in which is serious liturgy serious ritual serious attempts at transformation is liminal space liminality sacred space transformative space that is the space that opens up when the psyche, the, the great self, is manifest in this form. This is what the psychoanalyst has to get into, but must get into it consciously. Uh, Gene and Wallace Cliff were, were talking the other night about, about how easy it is for psychoanalysts to, to become inflated in an identification with the great magician. And priests and spiritual directors and clergy do that too. See. So, uh, so you got to realize this is a part of the great self, and you you need to utilize it, but not identify with it. That's the principle we'll be operating on today. So down here, this is the garden space. This is the Eden, the space of passion. It's either it's the, it, it is the garden of delight, and it is the garden of sorrow. When this is the space of intense love and vulnerability see if you love i guarantee you you will suffer see they don't they don't come separately if you love you will suffer and, and that is the space of the lover and uh it has a specific purpose in the psyche of making you human see that's its purpose, to making you feel... If you don't love, you're not vulnerable. See, if you're not vulnerable, you're not human. See. Now, of course, you can get in trouble with this, and you can spend a little time thinking, well, how do you get in trouble with this? Well, you get in trouble with this when you identify with a great magician. A man gets in trouble with this when he, when he identifies with a great phallus. See? I'm serious. Uh, and a woman with a great yoni. So many men, so little time. <laughs> See? Okay. Now, I wish I had more time. We'd go into that more, but... <laughs> <laughs> but that's not our purpose this morning. I'm trying to locate the struggle with evil in the psyche archetypally. Now, that's where we come here. It is in the warrior space that the archetypal structures in terms of the, the archetypal combat with evil is, it fits. And the space here... What's the word right below warrior? Right, right uh, here? Right Jihad. It's the Muslim idea of spiritual warfare. Struggle, spiritual struggle. That's what jihad means to the Muslim. To the Muslim, particularly if you want to understand the Shiites, they're mainlining, they're shooting up this archetypal structure. 
their their spirituality is 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 centered right here service to allah is struggle and if you're not struggling in the spiritual warfare you are not a muslim and so that is where this is located see and this in christian mythology excuse me liberation theology, liberation theology is, is locked right there uh armageddon the the fant the apocalyptic fantasies of, of the religious right are locked right here and so so there is this struggle now notice this this could when you don't when you don't know about this stuff you can be husband and wife here and then you can have always armageddon between you and you know there used to be a lot of so-called marital therapists that would play let you and him fight you two are not what's wrong with you is you two are not fighting enough you know they ought to be sued for malpractice in my view because if a couple is locked into this more fighting doesn't help all you get is a gotter damarang where the where the god and the goddess make mag, magnificent majestic warfare you know like uh world war ii battleships with their 16 inch guns going this way see uh but anyway the important thing to realize is that this is the space of combat with evil in the psyche. Yes. What does help the well, you've got to uh, help them understand that, that uh, their warrior self is real fine and dandy and good, but it exists to destroy. And, uh, and that they have to learn to participate in some of these other spaces. And what I do in my, couple work, my work with couples is I immediately come here. And I said, hey, you two, we need to help you find the garden because you have lost it. And you show me a couple with a lot of marital problems, I'll show you a couple that has lost the garden. Yes? The film that shows magnificent warfare between uh, uh, you know, the king and the queen, i never seen anything like it, is Dangerous Liaison. Yes. It's a phenomenal film. Yes, yes. Well, that thing is, that, that's got a lot of uh, wonderful archetypal uh, modes. But now we've got to move on. Remember where we are here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to deepen this now. We've got to get into this space more deeply. You ready? You're located here? Okay, here we go. Stay there because this is an elaboration of that space. This is the combat myth. Let me give you a reference for you that, uh, that love getting into serious mythological and historical research. There's a new book out with uh, Princeton University Press by a man by the name of Forsyth, F-O-R-S-Y-T-H. <clears throat> it's called The Old Enemy. And it is a comparative study of the combat myth. Now, remember, we're dealing with this not from historical critical work in mythology. We're dealing with it in terms of the psychology of the archetypes. But what this man has done is, in my view, provided you with a wonderful study of the archetype of the sacred combat. Here it is right here. They just happen to have some copies of this. It's also very cheap, isn't it, Sid? I think it's, oh, uh, it doesn't say. They, they didn't put the price in it for you. Okay, okay, it's on the back. $67.50. But it's worth it. If you really want to understand the archetypal uh, dynamics behind the human struggle about evil, it's the best thing I've ever seen. And what we will do in just a minute is go through some of this. But anyway, you've got to get a sense that in the psyche, the warrior aspect of, of the psyche, when it is functioning correctly, serves the king and the queen. There's your knighthood ideal. Now, what is the nature of the service? It is to defend cosmos, just order, a, a, a moral order, against the forces of chaos. That is what it's for. The warrior in the psyche, archetypally, in every culture, is to defend the just order, the moral order, against the forces of chaos. Now, you can see this a lot of ways archetypally, and if you study mandalas, what a mandala is, is an image of cosmos. 
and at the center, archetypally, is the two thrones of the conjunctio. Now, in patriarchal cultures, there's one throne. And in matriarchal cultures, there's one throne. In the human psyche, there are two thrones. And in the more primitive mythologies that you study, you see two thrones. In other words, in the deeper structures of the psyche, expressions in myth, you will always see two thrones, not one. Uh, you can see it in the ancient Egyptian mythology, and you see it in a lot of the, the extremely old mythologies. And they, have different, they have different wraps on that, but if you understand this stuff psychodynamically, you can see that this is the throne of the Kinyunkio, see, the two thrones. But it's always identified with a lot of archetypal imagery. You've got to study your Iliadi to understand this. The oxus mundi, the center of the world, the sacred tree. Who is the sacred tree? It's either the king or the queen or both, always. The cross of Christ, of course, is the sacred tree at the center of the cosmos. You must find the center of the oxus mundi of the cosmos or there will be chaos. Evil will triumph. Okay, so in the spatial portraits of the world that you see in the ancient world, it is always mandalic, always. And if you study ancient cities, cities are images of cosmos. Polis is cosmos in microcosm. So if you study Memphis in ancient Egypt, or not, not Tennessee. <laughs> That's right. You study, you study. That's right. But, but if you, the more, some of the most interesting studies today are in geography, sacred geography in geography departments, and are studies in architecture and geography departments where they're studying uh, the archetypal images of the city because they're grounded right here on this. For our purposes, we have to see that the thing which impinges and threatens always is chaos from the outside of the cosmos. And you could even envision this as a sphere, and chaos comes from all directions. And it is the king and queen in their, in their incarnation as warlords when they get up and go to defend the world against the forces of chaos. Now, in human history, that gets divided into social roles, and you get the knights who defend the king and the queen. But in fact, they are expressing an aspect of the great general himself or herself, uh, the warlord who carries the fight to chaos. In other words, the king doesn't always sit on the throne. Sometimes they get up and button up with their armor and pick up the sword. Now you can see well, my favorite image of the queen in her in her warlord garb is Aliens 2, Sigourney Weaver, my heroine. And, and if you haven't seen Aliens 2, you've got to see Aliens 2 because that is an image I tell my female theologian friends. If you want to see an image of the God liberator in female form, Sigourney Weaver and Aliens 2. If you hadn't seen it, you've got to check that out. I always try to sell VCRs. I get a commission. <laughs> okay. Now, the combat myth is often portrayed like this. And, but you need to realize that these are the same images just presented differently. Remember that the God, King, Queen, always, they are the center. And so wherever they are, they are the center. So when you're representing this spatially, uh, you've got a problem. But you need to recognize that this and this is really describing the same space. But here, our experience in the psyche, our experience of the enemy, if you've seen Sam Keen's book, Faces of the Enemy, we experience the enemy out there. In fact, the less developed we are in terms of psychodynamics, that's where we experience the enemy first. Uh, the more developed we are spiritually, and this is true of every human spiritual tradition of any depth, 
the first place you encounter the enemy is within. And only then do you turn to encountering the enemy without. Uh, this is true in the martial arts, uh, in the Oriental martial arts, as well as uh, a lot of our own spiritual traditions. But let me just run through this. <clears throat> Could somebody get me a little water? I'm going to run out of voice if we don't get me some water. This, again, here is the plane. You can see the plane of struggle. And in this old enemy book, you get a comparative charting of the different expressions that this has taken in human culture. And if you look at that and you don't believe in the archetype, then I can't help you. you know. Here we've got, I'll, I'll just go through these. I hope you can hear me. You've read Beowulf. Beowulf, who is the archetypal Christian king. Grendel the dragon. And they're struggling. In the patriarchal myths, Marduk fighting the great dragon of chaos, Tiamat. Now this is a, what I consider a patriarchal fantasy. You know, men love to dismember feminine grandiosity. And women love to dismember masculine grandiosity. The hard thing is for men to dismember masculine grandiosity and for women to dismember feminine grandiosity. We'll get more to that in a little bit. But anyway, in patriarchal myths, the, the masculine hero takes on the giant forces, feminine forces of chaos. So there's an image of evil. In Zoroastrianism, you get Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Light, fighting a Hiraman, the Lord of Darkness. In Jewish tradition, uh, there are a lot of really excellent studies coming out now about Yahweh as warrior. In fact, being a good Southerner, I kind of appreciate this, there are some scholars that think that Yahweh is what the Hebrews shouted when they attacked. And that's kind of like a rebel yell. Yahoo! <laughs> that's serious Bible scholars. Honestly, they, they've begun to think that Yahweh was a battle cry. And it was an invocation of the war god so they would win. And uh, so when, the, when Yahweh is attacking the forces of Baal, Baal represents chaos. the Dark Lord. In Indonesian mythology, I was privileged to travel extensively in Indonesia recently. Form of Hinduism, the great epic Ramayana. In the Ramayana, it's the great Lord Rama. That's a Hindu Christ figure. And who he is in struggle with is Rahwana. I started to bring my great Rahwana mask. I thought I better wait until I practice with that thing a little bit more so we don't get anybody possessed during any of these conferences. But I mean, it's a great demon face, you know. But Rahwana is the great lord of evil, the great lord of chaos. And Rama, the whole Ramayana is the story. And in Indonesia, this myth is alive. This is a, this, if you, you know, you don't go to the movies so much in Indonesia as you go to the dances in the center of the town and the all people of all ages come out and and everybody has tried out to be the different parts in this epic and they present on the stage the Ramayana and everywhere you look it's the Ramayana and they dance this myth and it's alive for them and on their ancient temples this is the myth that's on their temples you can study Hinduism in America and never even learn about this you can, well, Hinduism is this, that, and the other, but in Indonesia, Hindu, Hinduism is the Ramayana. And, of course, in our myth, you get the Christ-Satan conflict. Uh, yes? But you also find in Revelation, Lamb of God, Antichrist. Exactly. Now, see what I'm trying to get you to see. We're just doing psychology now. This is just archetypal psychology. This is in your wiring, and this is not in your software. This is in the main drive. 
And what you've got to realize is all these real sweet, nice folks, you know, that are going to do away with war, I, I hate to tell them, but warfare is built in to the hard drive. So in my view, and this is what I think you as Christians need to think about, in my view, the question is not whether we're going to do away with warfare or not. The question is whether we're going to engage in the real war or not. Human beings love to make war, especially men. I, I'm, I agree with the feminists here. While there is a female warrior in the hard drive of a woman, and you see it in Sigourney Weaver, while, there's a hard drive, while she's in the hard drive, th that doesn't get as much electricity in the typical woman most of the time unless she has to turn those circuits on. Men are wired for that constantly. And if you watch little masculine games, we call them blank contest. Think about that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they're, they're little war games. War games are masculine games. And the, 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 the tragic thing, if, in one view, uh, if, if the psyche in its, in its instinctual form is tragic, and I guess in some ways you might say that, uh, but that's not going to change. What, in my view, what you've got to do is to understand what the real enemy is and that's what our job this morning is and, and psychologically and you can do your own theology of it psychodynamically speaking uh, uh, I want to get now to what the real enemy is psychologically and uh, you can see this uh, in studying human mythology as well as in studying comparative psychoanalytic theory What is the enemy within? Now, I want to address just briefly Scott Peck's book, People of a Lie. Uh, his Road Less Traveled is a fine book. People of the Lie is a dangerous book and a, and a very, very misleading book. Even at the time that Peck understands a lot of important points about this, Where I can say that I want to suggest that you look at Peck's book so you'll know its good points and its bad points. He identifies the psychodynamics of evil as lying in, in, in pathological narcissism. I want to suggest to you that rightly understood, that is correct. Psychologically speaking, the enemy within, that is what human beings have known as the evil that afflicts the human race, wherever it's found, is pathological narcissism. And I'll get into that more in a minute. The danger about Peck is that he assigns a certain very few people with that category of being evil personalities. Obviously, Peck is not very familiar with the psychoanalytic literature. If he were very familiar with the psychoanalytic literature, he would understand that all of the psychopathological uh, syndromes manifest narcissistic pathology. Just because you're not a DSM-3 or DSM-3R narcissistic personality disorder doesn't mean that you're not a pathological narcissist. And see, if he had studied his psychoanalytic theory, he would know that. The other thing, when he describes meeting people in his practice that are so evil he can't work with them or he's paralyzed in their presence, if he had studied enough about countertransference, He would never have written that. <laughs> he would have talked to his supervisor about it. I'm serious. That's embarrassing to see someone who is so widely touted as the great psychotherapist who doesn't understand more about countertransference than that. Now, I'm not questioning that a lot of the people that he may have experienced as virulently toxic in terms of pathological narcissism, may not well may well not have been tremendously sick narcissist. I don't, but but any analyst that has a practice that doesn't cater merely to to well healed neurotics uh, will see very sick narcissists. And any honest psychoanalyst that's done enough analysis will know about the sector in their own personality that is full eaten up with pathological narcissism. You show me an analyst 
who is not aware of their own residual crazy, psycho, almost psychotic, borderline sector in their psyche where they are more autistic and incapable of love, they just haven't had enough analysis because the best work that's been done on this field shows that no psychoanalyst ever gets to the bottom of that finally. And the ones that think they have are the ones you don't want to go to. But let me just quickly run through these different theories. We're doing all right. Now let me just give you what I would define as the psychological root of human evil. I'm just going to bracket all that non-human evil. I'll let the theologians that are interested in all those niceties of the arguments deal with that non-human evil, earthquakes and all that stuff. I'm just going to deal with human evil. The fundamental mechanism of human evil, psychologically speaking, is pathological, infantile grandiosity. Pathological, infantile, grandiosity. Now, the interesting thing is that in the different schools of psychoanalytic thought, the different major schools, they all have a feeling for this. Some better, better and more clearly than others. But that is to say that, that whatever this is that, is that is behind and fueling compulsive, destructive human acting out in all sorts of ways, and I will get into this in detail in, in the uh, lecture on discernment and helping us look for signs of pathological infantile narcissism in, a, in ourselves because there are ways to dig that stuff up in your own self-scrutiny. But for now, very simply, there is this sort of uh, two to three year old high chair tyrant in the psyche and it's really in there. And the interesting thing, according to psychoanalytic theory, it's in everybody. And it is within. And it has certain recognizable forms it expresses itself in. Now, let's go back to classical psychoanalytic theory. Now, just very briefly, notice the characteristics of the two major structures that the human ego has to struggle with in Sigmund Freud's early classical psychoanalysis. Here you've got the little human ego embattled on two sides. On the one side, the superego, or we'd call it the conscience. Some would call it the bad moral conscience. On the other side, the id, or the it, the instinctual, the primitive, primary process, instinctual drives. What do they have in common? Well, they make totalistic claims. They make perfectionistic claims. They make grandiose claims on the ego. What are the grandiose claims of the id? Very simple. According to Freud, the id in you wants to eat everything it can see, including you, and it wants to screw everything, male or female, animal, vegetable, or mineral. And if you study, as I have, the sexual so-called perversions, you will find that human beings, see, contrary to what we nice folks like to look at, human beings manage to, following the drives of the id, to engage in sexual behavior with everything. And that is the it acting out. It wants to have sex with everything. It's, that, it's the thing that fuels that so many men so little time, so many women so little time of the promiscuous personality. Now, so, and it's also behind uh, those of us that ought to be in uh, Overeaters Anonymous. We want, we want to eat everything, you know. I see, I see a table of these good vittles around here and I just want to pig out, see. And it doesn't matter that I don't need it. I, I want to eat some more. It's so good. Those ribs we had the other night. <laughs> I won't even talk about wild turkey. Now, the superego. How is it grandiose? 
Well, it makes grandiose claims on you to be perfect. The superego is even brilliant enough to make grandiose claims about your being perfect in your sexuality. And there are a lot of folks, you know, they've read The Joy of Sex and The, the Joy of Sex Revisited and The Joy of Sex 3 and The Joy of Sex 4. <laughs> and every time they make love, they think, boy, I can't. What was about a four? On a <laughs> and uh, and and they never can just uh, they never can get into the garden because you know if you're in the garden you don't count. You know. <laughs> think about that one. <laughs> Got to think about that. <laughs> but the super ego is never satisfied with you. And one of the things you need to know if you're one of these ambitious professional types, you know, that's going to write a lot of books or uh, make a lot of money or get real successful in your you know, get a big church or whatever it is, what you're going to discover is that no matter how many books you write, no matter how much money you make, no matter how many homes you own, no matter how many uh, branches of your business you've got, there's going to be a part in your psyche that's going to say, yeah, you're not much. You're really a failure. Why don't you take a cocaine overdose? A lot of people. In fact, the more creative you are, the more that voice speaks. And the more successful you are creatively, the more danger you have from that voice. Because the more successful you are, you begin to realize, my God, I'm not ever going to be able to quiet this voice. That's why so many entertainers commit suicide. That's why so many successful professionals become drug addicts and alcoholics. Okay, so the grandiose self is expressed in the forms of the superego and the id in, in classical union, I mean, Freudian theory. Now, look at Adler. Now, a lot of people don't know about Adler, and you say Adler, a lot of people say power, power complex. Well, that's right, but it's so shallow it doesn't tell you anything about Adlerian theory. The genius of Adlerian theory is their intuition that behind ever inferiority, you know, they call it the inferiority complex. Everybody knows that word, but very few people know superiority complex. And if you don't know the concept of the superiority complex, you don't understand the inferiority complex because in Adlerian psychoanalysis, if you have an inferiority complex, you do have in the unconscious a superiority complex. And all Adlerian psychotherapy is, is the therapist will work with you trying to find the way in which you are acting as if you're entitled to a above human place in life. That's all Adlerian therapy is. They're going to try to help you rejoin the human race. Get down off of your high chair. See? And so the, what, what is known today in, in avant-garde circles as the grandiose exhibitionistic self-organization, Adler discovered years ago. They, they always come up with Adler's ideas and think they invented them. But the superiority complex is that great presuming self within which always beats you down and always depreciates you and other people and is never satisfied with you or other people. See? So there's the infantile grandiosity and Adlerian theory. If I had more time, I'd go into it more. But let's go on to the object relations theorist. There's a lot of work in this field, but they have what is known as the concept of the anti-libidinal ego. This is a part of your psyche which you have within which wants you dead. It does not want you in relationships that are satisfying. In fact, it will try to get you into relationships which you intuit will fail. That thus thus explaining a lot about the tendency of human beings to do the same mistake again and again and again with different people. But anyway, the important thing to realize is that here in this object relations theory, which is a very influential school of thought now, that there is a thing in the psyche that is not the I, but is a discernible structure which wants the individual dead. And if you're a practicing therapist, you see this thing acting in people all the time because you will notice that about the time they start making a lot of progress, 
they will do something to set themselves back. And when they get involved, you know, it may be a person that's, that's managed to always choose the wrong person to have a relationship with, you know, abusive men or women. And then they will find this absolutely wonderful, praise be to God, individual that doesn't abuse them. But it's so fascinating. Once you find somebody that won't abuse you, you become bored with them and start doing things to sabotage the relationship. Fascinating to watch. And in working with individuals, you're constantly having to alert them. Now, now which part of you is running this? You know, what, is this part of you that doesn't want you to be married behind this? They want you to sit in your room alone and drink? You know? And so uh, there's a whole literature on the antilobidinal ego, and there's a whole literature on a different wing of that talking about toxic introjects. That is, the parts of us which modern psychoanalysis recognizes as inner entities real inner entities that are out to kill us. And uh, now remember, this is not Jungian thought. This, this is other schools of psychoanalysis which recognize these compulsive, destructive forces within the psyche that are out to destroy the human life of the person. Uh, usually, they are perfectionistic. Usually, they are rageful and full of hatred and envy. And we'll get more into the marks of that stuff tomorrow. But, but, but these parts of the psyche usually are full of rage and they are inconsolable. In other words, nothing anybody could ever do would ever satisfy them. Uh, we don't have enough time to get into Melanie Klein, but... She is another person. She's, been, she's a Freudian, but she's been accused of being a Jungian because she believes that there are, in fact, these innate drives in the psyche which fuel hate and envy. And if the, in, if the person cannot learn to cope and counteract these inner enemies, these parts of the psyche that want to destroy the beloved and want to destroy the good life, then they will die probably by suicide, maybe by other forms of depression or compulsive behavior. Now, the school of thought that I want to recommend, the non-Jungian school that's most interesting and most easily related to Jung, is the school of Kohut's self-psychology. Heinz, H-E-I-N-Z, Kohut, K-O-H-U-T. His self-psychology. In self-psychology, they make a very clear statement. It's very interesting. Pathological behavior is the result of an individual's not being able to cope with the power of the grandiose self-organization within. Now think about this now. Get this now. I want you to try to get you ready for the understanding of what the archetypal self is in Jungian thought. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to, yes. But what I want you to get about this is that we're not talking theology here. We're not talking uh, some sort of uh, abstraction. We're talking about clinical phenomena that atheists see when they look at pathological personalities. They see these cohesion self-psychologists notice the way in which this thing inside an inner psychological structure discernible by anybody that has an eye to see called the grandiose self-organization, or variously called the grandiose exhibitionistic self-organization, that if the personality, if the human self is not able to, to relate to that thing adequately, they will be mentally ill. And we're going to get into the marks of that shortly. But one of the things it does uh, is the grandiosity takes the personality over in some way. That is, the infantile grandiosity destroys the human being. And the great struggle of the human personality, according to that school, is to learn to function in spite of the reality of this potential enemy within. Now, now in terms of Jungian thought, it's very interesting. This grandiose self-organization is not necessarily an enemy. 
It's only an enemy if you don't relate to it correctly. Which gets us to Jung. See, if you, if you, if you study this stuff, then you understand why human beings have so much trouble. Now, if you're one of these nice Pollyannish humanistic psychologists that think that there's nothing bad in there, everything in there is friendly. But I want you to know that the greatest of the depth psychologists and the psychoanalytic theorists, not just Jungian, know that everything in there is not friendly. There are some things in there, if you don't learn how to deal with it, will kill you. And we'll do it fast. As fast as possible. And so if you're trying to figure out why you get into so much mischief, you got help. <laughs> and, and in terms of, uh, of, our, of our work here, you, what I would want to argue is that you've got to understand that it's not all your ego's fault. That is to say, it's your ego's responsibility. Nobody else is going to handle it for you. But, but there are forces in the psyche that are not your ego that would like to see you dead. Okay. Now, Jungian, classical Jungian theory. Now, I'm not, I want to make clear, I'm not one of these so-called archetypal psychologists. I'm interested in a psychology of the archetypes. That's different. Archetypal psychology, that's kind of a, a large claim. I wouldn't want to be, be the author of an archetypal psychology. That's a high claim, and that means the prototypical psychology. I'm just doing a simple sort of journeyman, plain old, down-home, ordinary psychology of archetypes. Now, or, orthodox, quote, quote, unquote, Jungian theory, plain old centrist theory says there's an archetypal self. Now, this archetypal self is a psychological entity. It is real. It is not a theological construct. It is parallel. It parallels, in these theories, the grandiose self-organization that the Freudians have now finally discovered and think they invented. See? In other words, it glows with what Jung called what? Numinosity. It, thank you. People have studied this stuff. This thing is numinous. It glows with power. And this is power that is greater than human power. It is, uh, it is the, the stuff of Rudolf Otto's Mysterium Tremendum, Mysterium Fascinon. And Jung, throughout his entire work, makes it very clear the ego must differentiate from that. The best book that you can read on this whole process is Edinger's book called Ego and Archetype. And in that book, he shows how through the human life cycle, the ego, the I of the person, begins merged with that, but gradually differentiates from it, and in the healthy, mature personality, has what Edinger calls, and I like, I like this formulation, an ego self-axis or connection. Notice that the ego is not identified with the archetypal self, but is connected with it. What happens if the ego in an adult is not appropriately differentiated from the archetypal self? Well, infantile grandiosity in space. Jungians just use the word inflation. I like that. I think of a basketball, you know. You with your your little uh, air hose and you, your, your deflated basketball, and so you plug it in and you watch the basketball, you know, fill out. Well, the archetypal self is full of energy. And it will fill up the little basketball of your ego. But you've got to know when to take the thing off. Right? You've seen these pictures in cartoons of the people that can't get off of the air hose and they... And then they start to float. Well, that's, that's the metaphor here in Jungian thought. That is, there is energy coming off of that archetypal self, and you need it. You've got to have it. If you don't have it, you will not be inflated. You will be deflated. Or what? Depressed. Right. So hubris, the hubris of the Greeks, 
the pride of the Christian tradition, read Reinhold Niebuhr's Nature and Destiny of Man, occurs when the ego in some way or the other begins to be contaminated by archetypal energies and not just fulfilled or made whole by these archetypal energies. Now, I want to bring in here a concept that Jung used that you almost never hear, and I think it's important for us to get, uh, because we've got to distinguish between the personal shadow and what I want to talk about as the archetypal shadow. And the whole, this is a lot of, this is murky area. Now, everything we do from now on in this is going to be murky because Jungian thought is still emerging. And there's not any uh, definitive textbook that we can turn to to clarify all these things and have the last word on it. So this is going to get murky, but I want to show you some of the issues that are coming up now. But one of the central ones is this distinction between the personal shadow and the archetypal shadow. Now, the, a lot of people used to think the personal shadow was evil. Well, it's not evil. Most, most theorists now don't even talk about it that way. It may be experienced by the ego as evil, because the ego is one-sided and incomplete. And so the ego may shun something in the shadow. But let me tell you something that probably is in some of your shadows here that is not at all evil, like a lot of the people I work with. For example, their sense of their own beauty. With a great number of people, their sense of their own beauty is in their shadow. And if they receive a compliment, they cannot deal with it at all. They have to completely deflect it. That's because they were taught in their families that it, you shouldn't be too big for your britches and, uh, you know, you don't want to get uppity and so forth and so on. Uh, but that is in the personal shadow. It's not evil. And if, you're ever, if the person is ever going to have self-esteem, they're going to have to integrate that part of their shadow. They're going to have to learn that it is okay to feel good about yourself. And it's okay if somebody says, boy... Like I said to Jim the other day, man, that's a fantastic beard. You know, a person ought to be able to say, yeah, it is. <laughs> Wonderful. See? Yeah, but, but, you know, in our mistaken problems, this is where some of the Christian tradition has got problems on this. If, if Jim were to say, yeah, that's a wonderful beard, isn't it? They'd say, oh, that man's full of pride. See? But that's not true. See, that's where one of, this is one of the problems that the Christian tradition has had. That is to say, if you... If you if you shine and enjoy it, there's supposed to be something wrong with that. And that's why a lot of people would rather identify with Satan. See? Because if, if I have to be bad to be exhibitionistic, I'll just be bad. See? That, that's the way a lot of people feel. See? We'll get into that more later. But anyway, so the personal shadow is just what is disowned. It is not evil at all. It is something that is appropriate for the human being to integrate, and in fact, there is a moral imperative in Jungian psychology to integrate the shadow, the personal shadow. But what a lot of people do not realize is that Jung spoke of spirit complexes. And he made it very clear that spirit complexes exist in the psyche, which carry an enormous load of numinosity and cannot, indeed must not, attempt to be integrated into the ego. If you try to integrate them into the ego, the ego will be destroyed. Possessed, you might say. At least possessed. And very often destroyed in, you know, in uh, sort of a terminal psychosis. Now, you see this kind of thing very, very wi in a widespread manner. You used to see it more before antipsychotic medications. I'm serious. I mean, we've got medications now that if somebody comes in, if, if Christ comes into your consulting room, uh, uh, you know, you better hurry up if you're going to see him and talk to him because by the time the psychiatrist gets to him and gives him some of this antipsychotic meds, Christ will disappear. And, and all you will have is a very, very sort of zombie-like, uh, nice, uh, manageable... Uh, mental patient. See. Uh, but uh, the, the, like one of my students recently <clears throat> went to a retreat uh, at a monastery and with a group of people and had a wonderful time, <clears throat> got in touch with the archetypal self, and after a wonderful prayer and meditation announced to the other people in the group, <clears throat> I'm really glad I'm here with you. 
I am the second coming of Christ, and I can help the redemption of your soul, and all you have to do is come to me for uh, spiritual conversation. And uh, uh, that lasted a few days till they got the antipsychotic meds. But, but that is something that used to happen a lot. If you used to work like I did in, uh, in uh, southern mental hospitals before there were these antipsychotic meds, you, you met a lot of Christ uh, in St. Francis's and uh, all sorts of folks, you know. And, and you can see it with your own eyes. You can see the spirit complex invading a human ego, totally possessing it, and in some cases, uh, uh, irreversibly. Now, you see the same type of thing in individuals who think they are possessed by Satan. And there are more and more people today who are into that fantasy. You see, one of the, see I, I do a lot of work now trying to help people understand the psychology of Satanism as a movement. It's a burgeoning movement in the country today. Uh, right in River City. They're probably Satanists in your town. Uh, and uh, uh, there are various branches of Satanists, some more benign than others. Some of them are just sort of into assertiveness training because they've decided, you know, that the only way I can really be assertive, I can't be a Christian if I'm going to be assertive. I can't be sexual if I'm going to be a Christian, so I'm going to be a Satanist. Satan's on the side of sex. Well, you can see why they have pretty good uh, evangelism effort. I mean, uh, a lot better than some of our churches, I mean. But, but there are forms of Satanism which are extremely dangerous because they, uh, what they're doing is they're getting in touch with the spirit complex that is the uh, opposite of the, this Christ complex. And it, too, is a spirit complex, and it, too, cannot be integrated. And what happens is you get a possession of the human and they start acting this thing out. They're into what Jungians often call a negative inflation and they do things that are very interesting. They're very interesting. They're very horrible. But the interesting thing is they tend to do the same types of things. They tend to, uh, they tend to do a lot of animal sacrifice around the country and there's increasing evidence that, uh, that in a widespread basis they are doing human sacrifice. And one of the most disturbing aspects is that one of the more widely accepted practices that is occurring is ritual child sexual abuse. Uh, I recently was in a conference in which the uh, medical doctor uh, who was working on this showed slides of uh, the bodies of children who had been uh, used repeatedly in uh, satanic rituals in the Midwest, uh, and uh, it was enough to make your blood curl, curdle. Uh, but, but not for a minute would I, as a Jungian analyst, think that that's a human ego doing that to those children. You know, a healthy human ego. That's not a healthy human ego doing a religious practice. That is a human ego that is possessed by one of these spirit complexes that uh, in terms of the history of a lot of this type of thing, uh, one of the things that uh, that the uh, identification with archetypal evil will lead to is uh, total domination, power dynamics, and sexual behavior. I mean, that's one, you know, the, 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 the total dominance uh, and power uh, moves in sexuality is always associated with that, uh, with that particular form of uh, the archetypal shadow. So, in other words, there are these spirit complexes that are in the psyche that are not the ego that are both images of light and wondrous spiritual uh, you know, elevation and images of great, dark, uh, sadistic evil. They are structures in the psyche and uh, they cannot be integrated by the ego, neither the good ones nor the bad ones. And so what, what one does is to try to support the ego in its disidentification with all of these complexes and the attempt of the ego to use these archetypal aspects of the objective psyche to gain fuel and guidance and fullness uh, in living, but not 
get caught in infantile, pathological, infantile grandiosity in any of its forms. You follow that so far? Uh, I'm, I'm much more interested in, in having people connect with their healthy exhibitionism to their healthy enthusiasm. I, Christians talk about joy. We talk about it more than we experience it. But, but that's what that's about. Joy is an experience of healthy exhibitionism uh, and knowing that the true God loves it. The image of the true God in Jesus is the dancer. In fact, if you look at the archetypal king throughout world mythology, what does the king do? In order, he dances the world into existence. In fact, if you see that movie, uh, Richard Gere, of all things, is King David. I thought that was wild. <laughs> but one of the true things was that dan those dance scenes. If you study the history of kingship, you know that they dance the world into existence. They don't force it into existence. They don't coerce it into existence. They dance it into existence. Shiva, in the, in the images of the great king Shiva, he's seen as dancing the world. And uh, that, is, that is the human birthright. See, and Christians at their deepest level understand that, but they've never actualized it very well. They got, you know, Jesus got too much flack about that, and they decided that was dangerous business. The issue that you've got to deal with is the question of Jung's assertion, which I totally agree with, that there are many things in the psyche including the archetypal self, which you do not integrate. You do not integrate the archetypal self. You try to integrate the archetypal self, and you will be crazy. And to the extent that you are crazy, it is to the extent that you're already doing it and don't know it. See? In other words, if you tend to be an abusive male or female and tend to lord it over others, you are, whether you know it or not, you're acting out the God King or the God Queen. And see, human beings are supposed to be in touch. The ego is supposed to be in touch with the God King and Queen, not acting it out. If you're in touch with the energies of the God King and God Queen, then you will be centered. I'll go into all the things that you, tomorrow I'll go into all the things that happen when you're in touch with that deep center of the psyche because they're directly related to Christian virtues in terms of the past understanding of Christian virtues. But, but you must not get into some unconscious possession because when you do, you become the narcissistic personality disorder. The narcissistic personality disorder is someone who is possessed by this sacral kingship within. And lording it over other people is a good way to say it. They think they are the Lord. Yes. Just maybe uh, going beyond what you'd like to discuss, but uh, are you open to the possibility that the archetypal shadow, uh, though it's inappropriate for an individual ego to encounter, may be the problem of the collective race, and that it might be that its redemption will occur over a period of time by, uh, by the, its encounter with any number of egos? Well... That's very complicated. Uh, as there's no, I, I'm, one, I'm one of the group of people that believes that there is a growing human consciousness and that that human consciousness as it grows on the planet is not tribal. That is, tribalism in thought processes is less and more and more and more. It's not so totally engendered simply in one gender or the other. It's not racial. So there is a sense in which the more human consciousness matures that it has the human beings have less trouble with possession by the archetypal self. See, so uh, I would agree with that part of it. That, but that it's a lot more complicated than that because uh, because there are these. You've got the combat myth that's in the deep unconscious that the ego can resolve in its own way for itself, but it can't resolve for the objective psyche. I mean, it may be, I don't know what to think about all this, it may be that you human beings are going to solve God's problems, but 
uh, I wouldn't recommend for your ego to try to resolve in your own little life the conflicts of the objective psyche. Uh, to me, I've seen too many people trying to do that. And they're almost all addicts you know, of one kind or the other. We'll get into that a lot more tomorrow. But anyway, this whole issue now, you see, I want to, I want to reiterate now, the psychodynamics of evil, I will argue adamantly, because there is mythological support for this, there is comparative psychoanalytic support for it from diverse schools that don't agree on much anything else, that the mechanism of human destructiveness is pathological infantile grandiosity. The little Lord Fauntleroy on his high chair tyrant, his high chair throne, that is the fuel, or the female version of that. Now, the question, as you rightfully raise, and you need to think about during this conference because you will have to come down somewhere eventually on this, the question is, uh, how do you explain that in terms of, of Jungian psychology of the self and the ego? Well, you've seen one version of that, the necessity for the ego self-axis. That is, you must not identify with the archetypal self in any of its forms. Because if you identify with it, you will be overloaded. Your circuit breaker is going to go. And as we will see tomorrow, you're going to start having compulsive behaviors. Compulsive behaviors of any kind are a sign your circuits are overloaded. And your defenses are not working anymore. And so you're getting into acting out something that you are not. Uh, so, but in Jungian psychology, there are different approaches to this and the different ways you would locate or talk about evil. Now, it seems to me the simplest way to talk about uh, the, the uh, uh, psychology of evil in Jungian terms is just to be very clear that whatever else you say, it is inflation. And whatever else that you say, it is when the human ego takes in, attempts to take into itself energies which are not human. They are too numinous for the human. Now, remember what I said. I want you to take in all the numinosity that is appropriate to your humanness. I want you to glow. I'd like for you to shine. See? I want you to be creative. I want you to be enthusiastic. I want you to be filled up with yourself. I don't want you to be bored with yourself for life. You know? So there's some numinosity that is, that is appropriately human. That's the Imago Dei, I think. But... But evil will occur, clinically speaking, not in terms of some meta-theory, but clinically speaking, when you start trying to absorb into your ego energies that are not absorbable into your ego. And so that's inflation. But now let's get into this thing. Well, now, what causes this evil that you see in the psyche, this destructiveness? Is this the fault of the self? Now, the Jungians are all over the place on this. And let me just show you some of the options, and you probably can think of other options that I... This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the options. You can say that with Jung, that the archetypal self includes archetypal evil. That you've got Christ, you look at that, look at that, look at those charts he gives you in the volume Ion. A I O N. Archetypal self, you've got Christ and Satan as structures of the self. And so you can say, well, both good and evil are in the self. And then, uh, then some theorists, Jung, as, as John has pointed out, Jung kind of identifies that God, the Godhead itself contains good and evil as sort of a parallel to the archetypal self. Sometimes they equate the self and God. Some Jungians talk as if the archetypal self and God are pretty much the same thing. Uh, so uh, you, you might say that sometimes th that they might argue that human evil then may be, some of it at least, done at the initiative of the archetypal self. And some of them even say even done at the initiative of God. Now, then you get a position, something like Jack Sanford's, where 
there is sometimes a kind of a tendency to, to equate the self and God, but he's not quite, he doesn't really finally land there. The archetypal self is an, ex, an expression sometimes of, of God in the psyche. But Jack Sanford sees an optic independence of God. And the self and God are good for Jack Sanford. See. He doesn't want to go along with the more traditional Jungian readings. And he says, while the ego, while it will be, a, the self can be seen often, uh, you can read this in Evil, the Shadow Side of Reality, he'll say that while it will be appear to the ego that the self is the author of evil, that what is happening is something that the ego doesn't want to integrate, that should be integrated, the self is pushing through, through experiences for that person to integrate. And it will be experienced as evil. So you may experience your, your exhibitionism as an evil thing, and you may think it's awful, but uh, the self may try to get you to bring it out. And uh, so, so it's not to Jack the source of real evil. The self doesn't really author real evil, although Jack believes that there is real radical evil that is in the psyche that is not the ego. And then sometimes he will follow Kunkel and say that, that you know, Kunkel believed that the ego was Satan. That is, that ego, the egocentric ego, is the cause of evil. And Jack is impressed with that idea of the egocentrism of the ego. Uh, the question you've got to raise and, I, and we got to talk about this in our discussions. Well, now, is that all the ego's doing? In other words, is an egocentric ego egocentric because it chooses to be, or has it been possessed? See? I mean, how much choice is there there? Now, that's an arguable issue psychoanalytically, and we'll talk about that in our discussion. Uh, and then they, there are persons that think that the archetypal self is not God. It's clearly not God. It is more the imago Dei, the imago of God within. And see, there are even Freudians who are atheists and empirically, scientifically see a God image within. They don't believe in God, but they see this God imago within. And there are some Jungians that say, well, that would be <laughs> that would be the um, the Imago Dei. Then the question comes up: Well, but is the self is the is the self the image of good alone, or is the self does the self contain with it not just is the self, in other words, merely the archetype of order, or does it contain with it also the archetype of disorder within the self? See, that's that's a theoretical question. Is archetypal disorder what you might call the Shiva principle? Is the Shiva principle a part of the archetypal self? Or is it simply another structure in the psyche? Now, that is a, that is a technical argument. And you, you, you don't, there's nobody that's going to be able to tell you which one is right on that. Uh, and so there are a number of ways you can look at this uh, and you can see that there's a tendency, for example, with, uh, with Jack Sanford's point of view, you can see that egocentrism in the ego. There's your, there's your grandiosity. E the egocentric ego is inflated and grandiose. I want us to remember, though, what Jung had to say about, about dealing with evil. He said, uh, see, the thing, he, the thing he got into it with Christians about is an interesting thing. He viewed himself as standing up for the reality and agency of evil. Evil is not passive for Jung. He believed that the Provatio Boni doctrine in Christianity made evil sound too impotent and too passive. And Jung believed that evil was powerful and aggressive, always, and that every person was subject to it. And his point was that there were two resources. He says that, the Jung says, the human ego standing alone cannot defend itself against evil. Get that? The human ego standing alone cannot defend itself against evil. 
it, but it has only two ways to deal with it. It can turn to a trans-ego source of goodness for assistance. And it can turn to a human community for assistance. Without community, without human community, and a trans-egoic source of goodness and order, the ego will be overwhelmed by evil. Thank you, Ottawa. 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 Thank you, Ottawa.